After a very long and boring sermon, the parishioners filed out the church saying nothing to the preacher. Well, towards the end of the line was a thoughtful person who always commented on the sermons. Pastor, today your sermon reminded me of the peace and of the love of God. Well, the pastor was thrilled. Nobody has ever said anything like that about my preaching before. Tell me why. Because it endured forever. <laughs> I hope you don't feel that way here, but uh, we want to welcome you to chapter 3 of our series, The Greatest Story. Although the Bible is filled with lots of incredible stories, they all come together to form one story. The greatest story is about God's great love for us. The greatest story draws us in to the lives of incredible characters, just like me and you, and incredible stories as well. And did you know that you are actually part of the story? You are referred to in the Bible. You are part of the story. And because of that, you also have a story. Romans 15, 4 tells us this, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now, if you've been here for the other two weeks, you'll be like, well, that sounds familiar. Page one of my sermon is just review, is just introduction. So just to kind of keep us on the same track here. Now, this verse is lived out in Luke chapter 24. Well, on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, he joined two travelers as they were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It was about a two and a half hour journey. And on this journey, these guys are talking about the things that were happening, and, and they didn't recognize Jesus at all. And they were surprised that Jesus like, wasn't tracking with them. And, and so they said, well, we're talking about Jesus. He was a prophet in Luke 24, 19, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. The men went on to talk about how they couldn't find his body anywhere, and they were left confused. They were hopeless about the events that had taken place. Jesus, however, began to clarify their thinking. It says in verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. You see, as we go back to the Old Testament, the Old Testament is all pointing forward to Jesus. And Jesus gave these Old Testament prophecies. He talked about how they pointed to his death and his resurrection, beginning with Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Pentateuch. And he continued on with the prophets and what they said. Jesus told them the story. And when they heard what Jesus said, the Bible tells us that their hearts begin to burn within them. Suddenly there was life coming to their hearts. There was hope springing up in their hearts because they were recognizing who Jesus was and they were recognizing how all the scriptures was pointing to Jesus. And suddenly they recognized him. They said, it's true, the Lord has risen. And of course, they went and began to tell everybody who they had just encountered. Just as Jesus took these two men on this incredible journey through the scriptures and showed them how it pointed to himself we also are on a similar journey as we go through this series. Now again in the series, you're going to hear the tagline, hear the story, live the story, share the story. You're going to hear the story of all these Bible characters and all these events that happen. You're going to hear the story. But we want to encourage you, don't just hear the word, be doers. Live the story out in your life and also share the story with others. So, Two weeks ago, in uh, chapter 1, the story began with Genesis and the account of creation. In Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we know the pinnacle of God's creation took place on day 6. Verse uh, 7 of chapter 2, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. 
Can you picture that? Taking the dust, he forms that. There's no life there yet. All of a sudden, whew. sorry if it smells. I'm sorry if it's bad. There, you know, but he breathed, and all of a sudden, this this form of this man became into life. He breathed in life. You are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are the pinnacle of his creation. You are made in the image of God. You are created to worship him, to bring him glory and honor. You are created to walk with him in relationship. That was chapter one. Chapter two of the story in Genesis chapter three, one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So we looked at the fall of man, and we looked at how they were tempted. They faced a tempter. The devil is a liar. He is a deceiver. And we talked about how sin is desirable. It is pleasurable. Eve looked at the fruit, and it was, she said it was beautiful. It was pleasant. It was desirable. But we also recognize that there's consequences for sin. Because of that, man fell. Because of that, man's eyes was opened up to good and evil. And they were driven out of the garden, this beautiful garden. And God clothed them because they were ashamed of their nakedness. There's consequence for sin. We talked about that. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And this week and next week will be a, a focus on that, the wages of sin. The consequence of our sin is what these next two stories really talk about. I'm glad that Romans 6.23 doesn't end with the wages of sin is death. It goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So today we are now on chapter number three, the flood. Many, many years have passed since Adam and Eve's son, Cain, fought against his brother Abel and killed him. Can you imagine sibling rivalry? Can you imagine kids fighting? Anybody here ever fight with your siblings ever before? I know that your siblings never killed you because you're here today. I can see that you're alive, you're breathing. I love my brother a lot today. We had some difficult moments in life. And there was one day where I thought I was dead. I was with a friend, his name is Chris, and we had gone to my house and we were walking down the basement stairs to go to the bedroom that I shared with my brother. As I got to the bottom of the steps, I saw out of the corner of my eye something kind of rising up. I turned to look into my bedroom and there was my brother and one of his friends and they were standing there, and he was raising up a shotgun. And my brother said to me, Keith, I hate you. And the next thing I know, boom. Shotgun was probably five feet from me. I thought I had died. Fortunately, he had taken out all the BBs. And so there was nothing that came out. But my, I, he's lucky I didn't have a heart attack, right? I don't advise that at all. Maybe that's why there was days later where he would tease me and I would throw an ax or a skate or whatever was there just to get him to stop, right? It's amazing that we're both alive. I blame it on my brother's friend. He was always the instigator in the neighborhood and put him up to everything. So, But I thought I had died. Well, Adam and Eve, they saw the results of sin when one son took the life of another. Imagine how they felt at that moment. Now, there are 10 generations between Adam and Noah. There are about 1,656 years from the time that Adam was created to the point of the flood. And back then, they lived for 800 or 900 plus years. Can you imagine that? Some of you are thinking, boy, I'm 60 years old. I wouldn't want to live with this for another 800 years, right? Their bodies were different, obviously. That's a long time to live. That's a lot of uh, presents, birthday presents to have to give to 
great, 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 great grandkids. <laughs> Think of all the generations that would get together for family picnics and reunions there, right? Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered if it really makes much difference how we live? Does it really matter? Good so often goes unrewarded while it appears that evil persists without any punishment at all. No wonder so many times life just seems perplexing. Even though today's chapter in the story doesn't answer all of our questions, it shows that eventually God's justice becomes evident in human affairs. In Genesis 6, we read of how people were living so immorally that God said he would limit their years to be 120. And just two verses later, we read Genesis 6, verse 5. Let's read that. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals, the creatures that move along the ground, and the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. I'll have to admit to you, I've been a little cranky this week and probably will be next week too. <laughs> Just with the topic of this study, I'm like, oh my goodness. Can you imagine what God's thinking and going through and, and what happens to mankind and stuff? I'm like, oh, this is tough. Now there are some important words in these verses that describe the emotions that God was feeling. Twice the word grieved is used. And one time the word pain is there. We don't often think of God in those ways. But God was very sad when he looked at the earth and he saw the way that people thought, when he saw the way that people acted, that it was wicked, it was violent. Sometimes I find it hard to comprehend that God, who is love, and loves us so much would be filled with such pain and would grieve with the behavior that mankind had that he would say, I will wipe mankind from the face of the earth. Do you remember that cartoon character, Popeye? Some of you are like, no. Nope. The only thing I didn't like about Popeye, Popeye is he liked spinach. I could never, what? He liked, I don't get, I, I like spinach now, but not then, on myself. But Popeye had a saying that he would say quite often. He would say, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. Remember that? Famous line for Popeye. It seems that someone or something had Popeye, uh, pushed Popeye too far and he couldn't take it any longer. There's a billboard I've seen occasionally, and it says, don't make me come down there. Signed, God. Right? Things aren't going my way. I don't want to come down there. Now, remember back when you were a child, and you heard your mom or your dad would, would say to you from across the house, telling you that you were in for it, if they had to come down there or come to your room or wherever it was, Right? If I have to come over there, you're, if I have to pull the car over, you're in trouble, right? In our scripture this morning, God had had enough. It's like Popeye. He had all he could stand, and he could stand no more. No, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought God was love. All he could do is love. Well, King David, who wrote many of the Psalms, describes him this way in Psalm 103, verse 8. He says, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. And while he is not just filled with love, he is love, and he is slow to anger. But there is a point where perhaps our sin ends up pushing God so far. I can't imagine what he was thinking and the pain that he felt and the grief that sin had caused. You know, sometimes I think personally, I know I'm this way, I can think, oh, my sin, oh, man, it's not that big a deal. 
God loves, he'll forgive, whatever. And I lose sight of how my sin truly affects God, who is holy, who is just, who is fair, who is righteous. And I'm also thankful for a small word in the Bible. It's the word but. But. I'm so thankful that that word can be found in the story. In verse number eight, it says this, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. There's only one man. Imagine that. Out of all the people, only one man found favor in God's eyes. Noah was a righteous man. He obeyed God. Noah walked in favor with God. And one day, God informed Noah that he was going to destroy the earth with a flood. And God told him to build an ark, a large boat out of cypress wood, kind of something like this ark, if we can go to, to that. Is that working? There. Um, some of you, how many have been to the ark encounter? Anybody? A couple of have been. Darla and I went about a year and a half ago with my parents. Um, Boy, you get there, it's like, wow, that is huge. Go to the next picture. Um, there's a froze. There we go. Uh, oh, go back. The other back, the other picture is better. My beautiful wife is in there. I want to see that picture. No. <laughs> I mean, just look at the people there. That's kind of what, what you want you to see is the people standing there. Go to the next one where you see, look at the bottom left corner there and see the people and look at the dimensions of the ark. This is built to the exact scale that's in scripture. Uh, can you imagine building something like this without the tools that we have today? It's absolutely amazing. I think there's another one there. Again, you see the back of that. Incredible, incredible. Back then, you probably thought, oh, build a what? <laughs> build a, well, I don't, well, there's no Lake Superior here. <laughs> what are we doing? God told Noah to take inside the boat a pair, male and female, of every kind of creature, animals, birds, etc., and seven pair of clean animals. Also, he was to take food for them and for his family. And Noah obeyed and did everything according to God's direction. And Noah announced the word of God to the people while he built the ark, but the people did not listen. And Noah finished the ark. And God told him, take your wife and take your three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their daughters, a daughter-in-law, and enter into the boat with the animals. And Noah obeyed, and then God closed the door. Noah was 600 years old when the flood rains came. There's a comic strip I came across that I kind of liked, uh, if you can go to that. Um, <laughs> so the, the, the monkeys there on the bottom are looking at each other, and she's, she's saying, a 40-day cruise, just the two of us without the kids? Oh, Harold, this will be the best vacation ever. I hope it doesn't rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. In fact, for 40 days, water poured from the sky. And not just from the sky, it burst forth from the ground. And finally, the rain stopped. Now, this is a little side note. As Pastor, or as Dan would, would call it, this is a rabbit trail, just a quick one. But if you, if you ever want to do an interesting study in Scripture, Study different numbers. The number 40 here is what we're talking about. It rained 40 days. Again, study the number 40 in Scripture. It's fascinating. Now, for 150 days, the water flooded and covered the whole earth. And little by little, the waters receded and the peaks of the mountains began to appear. And thinking the earth was dry, Noah opened the window and sent out a raven who flew back and forth. And then he sent a dove but it didn't find a place to land either, and it returned to the ark. After seven days, Noah let the dove out again, and it returned, carrying an olive leaf in its beak. After seven more days, Noah again let the dove out of the window, and this time, the dove didn't return. The earth was dry enough, and God told Noah that they could leave the ark, and Noah and his family, and all the animals began to leave the ark. When I read the Bible, I always kind of think, I wonder, I, I kind of read, I don't read more into it, but I imagine more than what it's saying. And so I'm picturing the, uh, the lions looking at some other little creature, rabbits or whatever, thinking, okay, you got a two-hour head start. <laughs> On the boat, we're fine, but when we get off the boat, I'm ready for some good rabbit here. <laughs> Your minds ever think that kind of stuff when you're reading scripture? <laughs> well, they had been inside the boat for 370 days. <laughs> 
That's a long time to be with your family, isn't it? <laughs> what was the first thing that Noah did? The Bible says he and his family built an altar to thank God for giving them the protection. And then God put this beautiful rainbow in the sky as a sign that there would never be another flood to destroy the earth. A rainbow like that one. I had a better picture where the rainbow, I got it where the rainbow was hitting the cross here. Some of you may have seen that on Facebook. It's really cool. I couldn't find it anywhere. But anyhow, the rainbow. And I want to go to Genesis 9 verse 12 where we look at this promise that God had given them. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant, get this, for all generations to come. That includes you. That includes me today. So we are part of the story. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Verse 14. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I've established between me and all life on the earth. So we know when it rains and rains, and it sounds like this week is going to rain a lot, you'll see a rainbow eventually, and that's God reminding himself, it's like he's put a little twine on his finger. Oh, what's that for? Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember now. That's the sign. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. Now, God said he would never wipe out the earth by flood. At some point down the road, we know that the earth will be wiped out by fire. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth, but that's near the end of the story. We don't want to jump ahead to all that yet, so it'll all be fine, but just we'll get there later. Now, interesting, I want to jump ahead to Matthew and Luke. There's two gospels there where Jesus himself actually refers back to this story in Genesis chapter 6. So it's important enough that Jesus is talking about it. And he uses the story of Noah to point forward to a coming day. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus is saying this, and he says, No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. That's important to remember that. Some people say, well, Jesus is going to come in 1988, 89, or he's going to come in 2019 or whatever. Nobody knows. There are signs we can read, but nobody knows. And Jesus himself says, I don't even know. The angels don't even know. Only the Father knows the time of, of the return, of the rapture. Now, verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So get this. He's correlating the days of Noah and what happened there to the future coming of Jesus. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two men will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken, the other left. Again, when I read that, I'm always like, tell them! <laughs> Don't be with the other person and not tell them. If you're grinding with somebody, tell them. If you're making a meal with somebody, tell them. If you're working with somebody, tell them. I want who's ever beside me to go with me, right? Right? And then he says, verse 42, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have taken out his conceal and carry, and he'd have been, no, <laughs> He would have kept watch, right? And would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Friends, you must be ready. We know that Jesus is coming again. And the only way to the Father is through Jesus, through accepting what he has done for you. It's not about being good enough. It's not about how many times you made it to church, although, again, that's a good thing. It's not about if you were perfect in your devotions for this year or not. It's about Jesus and what he's done for you. And he says, you must be ready. There were several people that looked at that ark and thought, oh, foolish Noah, what are you doing? I can imagine he was the talk of the town. 
Boy, 600 years old, he's lost it, hasn't he? I mean, <laughs> Noah stayed faithful. He knew what God had asked him to do. He knew what was coming. The others just laughed. You know, I want to give you some quick lessons from the ark. Not all of them are deeply spiritual. Some of them are just practical. All right, number one, don't miss the boat. <laughs> don't miss the boat. Jesus is coming. Be ready. Don't miss the boat. Number two, remember that we are all in the same boat. For God so loved the world. There is no one outside the parameter of God's love. Not a single person. Doesn't matter from what country, what nation, what tribe. God wants them all in the boat. Number three, plan ahead. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. Plan ahead. Number four, I like this one. Stay fit. When you're really old, God may ask you to do something really big. <laughs> all right? When you're 100 years old, he may say, all right, it's time. You're going to do this. What? You know, I can't. All right, I'll, you know. Stay fit. Stay ready for God to use you. <laughs> Number five, don't listen to the critics. Just get on with the job that needs to be done. Number six, build your future on high ground. Number seven, for safety's sake, travel in pairs. <laughs> See, just practical, right? <laughs> Number eight, speed isn't always an advantage. The snails were on board with the cheetahs, right? You may not be the fastest. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Number nine, remember the ark was built by amateurs, the Titanic by professionals. All right? Friends, you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. You don't have to wait for the day where all the stars align and now, oh, oh, I can do something for God. God always uses people that are flawed and imperfect and don't have all the gifts and abilities and whatever. In fact, that's often who God chooses, as we'll see in several stories to come. God never picks the person that's got everything together. He would never be able to use anybody. Next week, we'll even see Noah and something that he did that wasn't that great. Number 10, no matter the storm, when you are with God, there's always a rainbow waiting. Some of you are in a storm right now, and you just need to know, man, God, are you with me? Are you here? You remember me? There's a rainbow. There's a rainbow. Why don't you think about this? What aspect of Noah's example, maybe his obedience, uh, maybe his faith, his courage, his endurance, what example of Noah is most meaningful to you in a situation that right now you are facing? What one characteristic of this man can you take and apply to your life that will bring you encouragement? In today's portion of the story, we learn once again that the heart of man is wicked. It's wicked. And we learn that our sin grieves God it brought him great pain back then. It brings him pain now. I don't want to bring pain to God's heart. I know I sin. I'm so thankful that his mercies are new every day. But with God's help and the Holy Spirit, I want to follow him the best I can. And I want to make the right choices according to Scripture as best I can. With His help, obviously. But sometimes I think in our sight today that we take our sin too lightly. That we don't always recognize the consequences that there are for sin. Does God forgive? Absolutely. But oftentimes there's still consequences that result because of our actions. Um, Sometimes God reverses those things. Sometimes we end up living with some of those decisions that we've made. Um, but sometimes I think we just take it too lightly. I love 1 John 1, 9. Again, it says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Friends, we learn today the heart of man is wicked. It is. There's an old song that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Our heart, that's what happens. 
And so this is a daily walk with God, sitting before him every day saying, God, cleanse me, wash me, give me strength to live for you today. I'm not defeated. I can walk in victory. And when I fall, I'm not going to stay on the ground. God, help me back up. I'm going to keep going for you. I'm not going to let sin have its final victory in my life. I'm going to be victorious because you were. I'd like the worship team to come if you would, and I'd like you to just close your eyes and bow your heads this morning if you would. Hear the story. Hear the story. What's the story of Noah and the flood saying to you today? Maybe on the side of just reminding us of the consequence of sin, of the wickedness of man's heart. We all know we don't have to be convinced of that. Maybe it's the story of Noah and his faithfulness, his obedience, his endurance, willing to be laughed at to obey the will of God, whatever. What's one thing the Holy Spirit wants you to take from this story today, this part of the story, this chapter, and apply to your life? Hear the story. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I recognize there may be some here today that maybe you're not ready for what Jesus talked about with the story of Noah about his coming. Jesus has promised in Scripture, he is coming again. Nobody knows the day or the hour where we can read the signs, and to me the signs say it's very soon. I'm not going to try and scare you into heaven in any way. God has given us all a free will to decide for him or against him. But this morning, by the very fact that you're here today, you're probably saying, you know what, I, I, there's something else out there. I need something. I'm hoping this is God. This is the, the thing I've been looking for. And today I believe that you found it. That Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, that he loves you so much, and that there is no sin that his love and grace cannot cover and remove from our life. The Bible says he removes it as far as the east is from the west. And even though Satan daily accuses you before God, Jesus continues to remind the Father, nope, they're forgiven. They're covered. They're free in me. If you're here today, and maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus, today would be a great day to begin your relationship with a God who loves you and cares so much for you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you are desiring to follow Jesus, to give your life to him today, to invite him into your heart to forgive you of all your sins. With everyone prayerfully thinking about their own life, is there anyone here today that by the raising of your hand you'd be saying, Pastor Keith, man, today's the day. I want to choose Jesus. I want to surrender my life to him. I'm tired of the way that I've been living. I can't do it on my own. And I want to be ready for that day that Jesus comes again. I want to be in the boat. Anyone here this morning at all? Yes, thank you. I see that hand in the back on my right. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. Anyone else this morning? Again, I don't want to scare you into this at all. This is about God loving you so much, having a plan for your life, and his forgiveness coming into your life and making you brand new in Christ. This is just the start. Anyone else? Yes, thank you. I see that hand in the back center. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With every eye still bowed, or closed and head bowed, perhaps there's some of you here today that say, Pastor Keith, there, there's, there's a sin that just keeps messing me up. I need victory in my life today. I need God to help me overcome this thing. I can't do it on my own. I've been determined in the past, but I need to just surrender before him and invite him to help me overcome this thing. If that's you, would you raise up your hand right now? There's something you just say, I just need to overcome. I need victory in this right now. Yes, thank you. I want to invite everyone to stand together, if you would, with me. And I'm going to pray a prayer. And I'm going to invite all of us to pray this prayer together. Again, this prayer is not a magic formula. You can say the words that not mean in your heart. It's not going to do any good. If you're sincere with God and you mean this, God's about to forgive you of your sin and transform your heart. Let's pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. I confess that I have sinned. I now invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me my sins. And help me live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. As we sing this next song, I'm going to ask Pastor Sam, he's going to come down here. If you prayed that prayer, he wants to just meet with you real quickly to give you a little booklet that's going to help you grow in your faith. As we sing this song, let's make this our prayer desire as we follow God in victory. Let's just take a moment this morning to thank him for his grace and his mercy. Let's thank him for his love. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we praise you. We exalt your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us to walk in victory. And God, I pray that you would help us to be able to go from this place to share the good news with those around us. Lord, your word says you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And Lord, part of your plan is for us to live the story and to tell the story. Lord, I ask that you would give us opportunities this week with friends and families, with those we come in contact with, to be able to share the wonderful good news of God's love. Lord, bless each one as we go from this place, but not from your presence. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Lord, bless you. Have a great week. As always, the altars are always open if you would like to just come and wait in God's presence.